Welcome to A Walk in the Park with Gil, where every other week I invite fascinating people to talk about cities. Sometimes it's about parks, others about walking, riding bicycles, using public transit, or children and others in cities, public health, the environment, and much more. My name is Gil Penalosa, and I was born in Bogota, Colombia, where as commissioner, I led the design and construction of over 200 parks and took a small program of open streets called Ciclovia and turned it into the world's largest pop-up park with 121 kilometers, 76 miles of car-free streets where people of all ages and backgrounds enjoy the presence of each other as equals. 17 years ago, I created 880 Cities, a non-profit organization based in Toronto, Canada, where I live. Before the pandemic, I had worked in 345 cities in all continents, which is why my master classes now are called Gill in 345 cities. This bi-weekly webinar is a way of giving back, always free. Invite anyone who cares about cities and people to join us. Your comments and suggestions are always welcome. Today, we have three amazing speakers from Trust for Public Land. And I wanna welcome all of them, Mary Alice Lee, Sally Mukib, Daniel Denk. Thank you very much for having accepted the invitation. Something that seems obvious anywhere in the world is that the playgrounds in the schools should be open to the community and should be community hubs. It's obvious, but it's, it doesn't happen. Sometimes common sense is the least common of the senses. And I vote in many communities that have very few parks. And you say, but how about the schools? No, they put 10 foot high fences and they are locked after 4 p.m. They are closed Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. And, but now there is a movement to change that. And these three women have lots of experience on how to do it, how to eliminate barriers, how to get boards of education, cities, communities working together. And Sadia is the expert in public health for TPL. So we are going to hear from Mary Alice and Danielle from the practical point of view. What is it, greening greyhounds, what, what it is? And they are going to show specific examples. And then Sadia is going to talk about the benefits. And we're going to hear from all of you. By the way, remember that the chat, whenever people are doing presentations, we don't use the chat. After the presentations, when we have the dialogue, please use the chat as much as you want to. So the first, the first presenter is going to be Mary Alice. Mary Alice, welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, everyone joining us today. I'm going to share a screen. Uh, I'd like to. Um, my name is Mary Alice Lee. I'm the director of the Playgrounds Program for the Trust for Public Land here, based in New York City. And um, this is actually an example of some of the work that we do across the five boroughs of New York City. Um, you can see to the left, there's a before picture. That's what the, um, the schoolyards look like before our intervention. And then on the right, you can see afterwards um, what, we, what things look like um, once we have finished the design, which is great. So I'm gonna just talk about how we get there. Um, when we first began this program in 1996, nearly 90% of the city's low-income high-density neighborhoods failed to meet the accepted standard of two and a half acres of open space per thousand residents. And over half of New York City's elementary schools, their, their schoolyards looked like this. It was um, when schoolyards were first built, um, when schools were built um, around the, the city, you know, a lot of them just had asphalt and that was the place where kids played. If you were lucky, you might have a basketball hoop. Um, there was no shade, no water fountains, nothing really fun to do. And, you know, also because they're asphalt, um, you know, they have tripping hazards and puddles and all sorts of things. And so the Trust for Public Land um, wanted to step in and make that change. Um, part of our mission as a national organization based in the United States of America is to connect people with the land, is to create um, recreation and, and park spaces um, for people within a 10 minute walk of, of their home. And so um, our solution was we were going to reimagine these asphalt schoolyards as community playgrounds. And we wanted to do that um, by incorporating the people who were going to be using the park, the users, and making them the designers of the park. We didn't want to just come in and say, we think you should have this. We wanted to really hear from both the students in the school and the community members about what they would like to have in their yard. And they really 
um, have become the designers of these yards together with our landscape architects and create these really beautiful spaces. As you can see, this is um, a site in, um, in the Bronx by the Frog's Neck Bridge. Um, there really was just a very unwelcoming place to, to, uh, to play for the, the over a thousand kids who, who went to that school every day. Um, when we were finished, there's a turf field, there's a beautiful garden area, outdoor classroom, green roof gazebo, play equipment, running track, basketball courts, volleyball courts. Um, it's just a really special place to be. Um, and also there's lots of shade from the trees, um, which is very different from you know, what, what used to, to be greeting the kids when they would go out for recess or line up or be dismissed um, after school. We started um, in 1996 um, and we um, first started actually on vacant lots. In the late 1990s, New York City um, had a lot of vacant lots um, that were um, not being used. And so originally we were able to start by working with community groups um, to, to create these spaces that then the Parks Department of New York City took over. So at each of our sites, the most important thing we've always thought was the inclusion of the community in the design, and then also in the stewardship of the yard afterwards. So that way it's a really community space. It's not just something that we're plopping down and hoping for the best. We're really engaging you know, communities to, to make these spaces that work for them in their neighborhood. Um, and so after a few years of doing these um, vacant lots, the city began having a housing crisis. And so there became less and less vacant lots around um, for the Trust for Public Land to be able to, um, to renovate. And so we began to look around, where else could we go since all these vacant lots were taken up by the much needed housing? And we came upon schoolyards. As, as I mentioned, um, there were so many schoolyards across New York City. Um, there's about a thousand school buildings in, in the city. And um, many of them just had those asphalt parking lots as places for kids to play. And so we began to work with the Department of, of Education, which is in New York City, um, the owner of all of the, the school buildings um, to renovate schoolyards. So Trust for Public Land started out by just raising private funds entirely to cover the design costs and also the construction costs. And so our, our first sites were very bare bones because um, at that point we raised about $500,000, which is not a lot of money to do construction of a playground. We were able to put in things like, you know, trees and basketball um, courts and turf fields and running tracks and play equipment, but um, we really needed more money. And so the Department of Ed saw how well this was going. And so they said to us, you know what, we would love to continue this partnership and let's, um, let's do more. And so at that point, the city um, gave us money for construction and then TPL only had to raise money for our private costs. And that was a big help because at that point, um, what, they were what we call million dollar playgrounds where the city um, gave $666,000 while TPL raised $333,000, which covers um, the landscape architects, the engineers, surveyors, phase ones, all the things that you need um, in order to design and construct a, a playground. And um, that went quite well, so much so that when Mayor Bloomberg came into office as mayor, he tapped the Trust for Public Land to be the agency's um, nonprofit partner on one of his initiatives for Plan YC. Plan YC was probably a, a lot of you know, but it was a really um, wonderful program which thought about um, how New York City is going to change um, by the year 2030. There was an estimate that we'd have at least a million more residents um, currently, we have about 8.3 million, so it would be in 2030, you'd think you'd have over 9 million. Um, and also just how um, the city could function better, you know, and, and accommodate um, that increase in residents. And so one of those ideas was to create um, more, um, more parks. And one of the ideas was the School Yards to Playgrounds Initiative, where um, we worked with the city to create an additional about 200 playgrounds on city schoolyards across the country. And once we did that, um, we then, um, you know, we really opened up so many sites that had not been opened before. And that was really wonderful. Um, and then when, um, as Bloomberg was leaving, we were looking again for where we could get some money for the construction of additional playgrounds because we had, you know, done 200, but there's, you know, about a thousand school buildings in the city. And while not all of them um, can be, um, have you know spaces that are, are appropriate for playgrounds, you know, hundreds of them do. And so we um, partnered with the Department of Environmental Protection who um, 
is giving us money for um, green infrastructure. So now we're excited because we're also able to, besides creating a, a wonderful place to play for the kids, we're also creating um, something that is capturing stormwater on site and preventing it from going into the city's uh, sewer system. A lot of um, older New York cities have something called combined sewer overflow, which means that when it rains hard, um, the water that goes into the sewers can overwhelm the sewage treatment plants. And that means that unfortunately, water that usually might be treated um, goes into our city's waterways and pollutes the waterways. And so by creating things like green infrastructure playgrounds, we're able to capture that water on site. And that means it prevents it from going into the sewer systems and then polluting our, our, our um, waterways. And so we're really happy to be able to add that component um, to our designs. And, um, and then uh, most recently, we also entered into a new partnership um, with some funding um, from both the federal government and also um, Extreme Weather Task Force uh, funding. Um, again, you know, it's because our playgrounds are helping um, with the stormwater management. Um, so now we have over 220 playgrounds across uh, the city, the five boroughs of New York City, which are Staten Island, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. And um, for all of our sites, the most important thing is that we're working with the students who go to the school. You know, these schools um, in America, we go to school in New York City, roughly September to June. And um, so you have, you know, roughly a thousand kids using a schoolyard every day. Um, they're using it for lineup and dismissal. They're using it for recess. They're using it for physical education classes. And so we wanna make sure that um, that they really are able to use these sites um, to um, in, in a way that makes sense for, for what they need. Um, but then we're also encouraging them to think about how it can be used after school on weekends. These sites are opened by the school custodial staff um, to the public after school and on weekends. And so that's something where we wanna make sure that people from the community are involved in the design so that they feel comfortable, that it's a place for they, them to come and enjoy afterwards. It's also very important for us to have um, a lot of as much nature as we can um, in, in the form of trees, uh, bioswales, uh, learning gardens, butterfly gardens, you know, whatever makes sense for that particular um, neighborhood and school. We also, again, want uh, climate resistant design, you know, thinking about using recycled materials um, and permeable pavers and um, items like that. Um, we're also really um, emphasize that we really want a community partner, someone who's going to be able to come in and do programming in the yard after school and on weekends to encourage community involvement. And also TPL helps with stewardship. So once we open these yards, we don't walk away. We're still there to give advice and run environmental education programs. Things as simple as, you know, we identification workshops. So they, if they're doing some gardening, they know not to pull out the flowers, but to pull out things that are weeds or, or other things like that. Um, one of the th things that we do at each of our schools is we work directly with the students. We have created a curriculum where we're working closely so that the students really become miniature landscape architects. They're talking about the existing conditions in their asphalt yard, where the puddles are, where the cracks are, um, where it's noisy, um, where they might get into fights because there's nothing to do because they're bored, and you know where they might want to sit down and read a book, a quiet space. We also have them measure the yard and talk about how much space we have and also how much we have in the budget. Um, they then um, create a survey so the entire school gets to vote on what they would like to see in the yard. Um, often the most popular things are a drinking fountain and um, also a turf field because the turf field can be used for many different items. Um, you can play soccer, football, tag, you can lie around on it, you can do gymnastics. So it tends to be pretty popular. We also talked to them a lot about the importance of green infrastructure and how the elements that we're putting into the yard um, can capture stormwater. Um, so we have things like the outdoor classrooms with permeable surfaces um, and also the importance of green roofs. We also talked to them about um, rain gardens and the fact that our turf fields can capture stormwater. So we have the gravel underlay and a perforated pipe that brings water um, throughout the, the yard. Um, once it's captured uh, when it rains. And so those are just some great ways of having a functional yard, um, which looks attractive, but is also capturing stormwater at the same time. Once the yards are, um, are um, designed, we also um, wanna keep the community engaged as much as possible. Often we're doing things um, during construction, um, like mural painting 
or um, we do uh, planting right before we open so that the kids get a chance to, um, to plant in the yard that they help design. Um, and then continues afterwards as well that we want the kids because a lot of the kids that we work with um, live in apartment buildings and they might not have a backyard to garden in. And so at school, having raised planting beds or, or tree pits to, to dig in, that's something that um, is really important for us to introduce because we want them to also have the opportunity um, to, to get to, to know and, and love plants. Um, we also think it's really important again after the the yard is open to continue to have these events. We don't want to just leave the yard and hope for the best. The more positive uses you have in a yard, the less negative uses um, are possible. Um, so it really cuts down on crime and uh, vandalism if you're actually you know, having people enjoying the space. All of our yards are taken care of by the school custodians. They get paid um, an extra um, stipend um, every year um, for the extra work that goes into um, on, you know, on top of their job, um, doing the extra cleanup and the opening and closing for the community. And so um, we want to, you know, help them as, as much as possible. Um, so this is um, just, as I said, a sort of a close-up example of the work that we do in New York City. And I think I'm going to hand it back to, to Hill. Mary Alice, thank you very much. Uh, that, uh, th that was great. I think that it's a uh, I want everybody on the line, uh, don't be afraid that New York has over 200 schools that if you live in a small community of 10,000 people and you only have three schools, you can do those three schools. If you only have one, or even if you live in a big community and people don't wanna get on board on all of them, you can do your school, the one in your neighborhood, a, a bigger one. So, so, so I think this is exciting. By the way- Actually, I mean, we started it in 1996 and you know we did you know for about six years we've only you know we did about two or three because it took such a long time for us to do it and so you know we've been around over 20 years to, to build this amount so definitely just just get started and and um and believe that you can do it the second presentation is going to be by danielle then danielle welcome Thank you. It's uh, following Mary Alice is a very tough act to follow, but I'll say that that's pretty much what I do for my job at the Trust of Public Land. I direct our community school yards initiative, which is looking to uh, take the great work that started in New York and scale it up around the country. And, and so for me and for a lot of what we're working on is, is thinking about the systems to embed this practice um, around the world or I'm sorry, around the country. But knowing that this audience is global, um, I, I hope to share this framework, which is a national framework, but uh, as a framework that can perhaps inspire or you know, help motivate some of the work that you're doing in your own countries. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that might you know, follow up on that. But really, I'm sorry to say that this is really a national initiative. And so I have a lot of US-based stats in here, but they are scalable, they are applicable, hopefully. Um, so we think it's a tremendous opportunity to take the schoolyards and let me just see if I can advance slides here. Okay, um, to think about the scale of schoolyards across the country, there are 50 million students enrolled in our schools, uh, 2 million acres uh, managed by the school system, 4 million teachers who interact with schools every single day, and 80 million people who live within a 10 minute walk of the school, including 20 million people who currently lack access. And as you may know, the Trust for Public Land, and as Mariella said, is motivated to think about how we can help to close the 10 minute walk gap that exists um, in the country and schoolyards are a really important strategy. Oop, there we go. Um, so we have already started to scale up our program. Um, as Mariella shared, we have you know, more than uh, 216 schoolyards, 220 now schoolyards in New York City. We have grown this program to Newark, New Jersey. That's a very long standing program. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Camden, and across the river, or across the country rather, over in Oakland and um, now in LA, where we're really working with multiple school districts to break down the barriers that exist, to combine and think about partners, municipal partners that can come to the table to support capital investments, to support stewardship and programming investments, and, and scale up this practice so that every child and every community can have a community school yard. Um, you can see here um, the status of the programs that we are supporting and helping to grow and where there's exploration. Um, and I, I saw in the chat, there's a handful of people that are um, dialing in from many different places around the country. And I'm hoping to see our 
our docs populate to places where you might be working because we also are trying to provide some more technical assistance um, because we know that every child in every community is not gonna have a schoolyard if we're not sharing what we know. And, and so that's a big part of, of getting to scale. We're motivated to do this because there are multiple issues that face this country. And some of these are global issues. Um, I already talked about the lack of access to a park within a 10 minute walk. It's hundred million people across the country. Um, park serving communities of color, unfortunately in this country are too small, about 40% and um, too crowded. Um, and we think that's a real equity issue we're trying to resolve. Where you live, as you know, informs your health outcomes. So trying to put a park within a 10 minute walk is essential to that upstream intervention. Um, poor community facilities uh, contribute to the education gap, which is um, something that really needs a lot of attention and, and, and that helps to um, motivate a lot of school districts to lean into this practice. Climate change, as you all know, are you know, compounding environmental injustice, especially in communities that already say the, uh, face the worst burden. So you know, focusing this work in places where the impact can, can be most um, you know, impactful is really important. And then you know, communities these days, as you all know, are trending towards uh, increased physical isolation. Um, and it, there's really important need to bring people together, to bring people together outside. And schools are a really wonderful place to do that. Um, when we think about the community schoolyard um, model, it's not necessarily a beautification. And we really want people to not think of it that way. It's really an intervention to address equity, health, climate, education, and community. Um, and this wheel sort of um, depicts the different outcomes that community schoolyards have on either students, teachers, and community, but it helps us to distill where we wanna work and how we wanna work. Um, and Sadia, I know, is going to really unpack the health aspect, so I won't go into that in too much detail. But I will say that at the Trust for Public Land, we're inspired by the intervention of community schoolyards, and, and we've done analysis to look at where um, health, climate, equity, education gaps stack up across the country. Um, and, and you can see at the scale that there's a handful of cities, predominantly cities that um, are facing a lot of water and sewer issues because of combined sewer overflow and that intervention that Mary Alice talked about. But you can see a lot of cities have been identified as priority locations that can benefit the most from these. But what we love about this analysis, and I have put down the URL and I can also put it in the chat, is that as you zoom into the state level, you can begin to see the cities around the states that also stack up within that geography. And then you can zoom in again to your own school district and see specifically where, what schools in particular can be um, very impactful when it comes to addressing the health, climate, education, and equity gaps that exist. So this tool is public and available, and I encourage you to take a look. Um, all right, so I wanna just touch briefly on the climate outcomes of schoolyards. And as Mary Alice shared, the work that we're doing here, bringing in nature-based solutions has tremendous impact in managing stormwater, bringing down heat island temperatures, cooling off the actual building, which reduces the, you know, the carbon offset of the education system, which is really important when we think about climate change. But more than anything, it provides an opportunity for those students to see firsthand what a climate intervention looks like, how it feels, how to design it, and how to be a climate actor so that when they grow up, the children that are you know, exposed to green schoolyards, to community schoolyards, can make positive change within their own community, can start to be uh, agents uh, and activators for climate action. And so we think it's really important, especially when we think about the, um, the eco-anxiety that faces children today, to be able to show them that there are solutions that parents and adults and caretakers and their teachers, they, they care and they, wanna, they want children to be inspired by this work. Um, I won't go into the health and uh, equity outcomes as much as I know that um, Sadia will go into that, I will say that the process of creating a community schoolyard really needs to involve both the students and the greater community. Um, because when you open the door to the community after hours, it brings in a wealth of support, it brings in stewardship, it brings in capacity to help maintain during the summer when you know school might not be in session, it helps build stronger bonds between that school and that community, helping to position the school as a hub. And when we think about increasing climate threats increasing, you know, um, who, you know, hopefully there's never another pandemic, but the health needs that um, schools face in terms of providing resources 
the schools as a community anchor, as a hub are really important. And so bringing the students in with the community and also you know, designing the space so that it can benefit the community after hours is really essential. And part of that tool is also implementing what we call joint use agreements, which are legal agreements between school districts and municipal partners that um, allow for that shared use after hours. Um, we actually uh, track the uptake of creating joint use agreements, and we've seen a 30% rise across the country. So it's definitely uh, an important legal tool to consider um, that we've been able to use, and I encourage others to think about. The education outcomes, of course, during the design process are very strong, but then after, when the school year is open, um, the students have a wonderful laboratory for learning, and it, it brings science to life. It brings mathematics to life. Students have better attention spans. When they are outside, uh, they retain more. And we're starting to see um, through some data and analysis that the, um, the academic testing um, for math and English language arts for um, K-12 or for elementary school students, um, data is starting to suggest that it's increasing. Um, which we think when that data does go out live will make a significant impact in um, school districts wanting to uh, adopt community school yards. On here. So for the Trust for Public Land, in order to take this to scale across the country, um, there's three primary actions that we must be taking, and that's to embed evaluation into how we create community school yards so we can strengthen the evidence base. It's to advocate and to push for additional funding at the federal, state, and local levels, and also the tribal levels, and also to look at policy change that can help to enable um, comfortable adoption of community school yards and strategic public partner, pri public private partnerships are a big part of that. Um, and then inspire, you know, we as a trust for public land cannot do this work alone. And, and there are many other organizations, um, a handful, I wouldn't say it's a huge bucket of organizations, but there's a handful of organizations that also are taking, um, you know, these efforts and we really need to work together to, and we are working together to inspire and build the movement and to disseminate um, what we've all learned to make this something that others can take on. So when it comes to evaluation, um, we're doing um, some work right now to build out a standard protocol so that we can be very um, articulate about the, um, the health, climate and education interventions and, and their outcomes. Um, this is, is specific because if you want to partner with the school district, they want to know how their students, how their bottom line is going to be impacted. They want to know, is it going to increase attendance? Will teachers stay at the school longer? Will academic test scores improve? Um, so those determinants are essential. And that's part of why we're really excited about the data that's actually coming out of the New York City evaluation. Um, and I, I will try to share with you guys as we start to get that out, uh, because we do think it's going to be a groundswell opportunity. Um, but when you think about um, the climate impacts, you know, the water um, quality improvements, uh, managing that stormwater that Mary Alice talked about, that kind of information wants to be scaled up. And so the more we can be particular about the numbers and the outcomes, the more others will adopt this kind of practice. And I could go on and on. And, and there's certainly some really important health outcomes that we're studying as well. Um, when it comes to advocating, as I said, we're working with the federal level, the state, local and tribal level. Um, some really exciting work right now, um, you know, at the state levels we have um, Governor Newsom in California just put aside um, $50 million of, of the state budget to um, support the creation of community school yards across the state, which is fantastic. Um, we actually see in Georgia, there is a community um, at the legislature forum just to focus on outdoor learning, increasing opportunities for outdoor learning. Um, some park departments in, um, across different states are um, recognizing schoolyards for their recreational outcomes as long as there is a uh, joint use agreement in place. So we're starting to see and, and act as an organization on different policy levers to increase um, at the state level the practice of creating community schoolyards. And at the Trust for Public Land, we um, have a robust federal affairs team that works on national policy. And so we're working on um, different tactics to try to increase the practice of creating community school yards at the federal level as well. Um, and certainly locally, um, you know, the local opportunities are vast. Um, if you live in a community that has a combined sewer overflow, there's a significant opportunity to bring in a substantial portion of your budget to manage stormwater. If you live in an arid community, you can store stormwater and use it for irrigation later. So 
depending on the climatic challenges, there's also opportunities to leverage resources. And so we like to encourage people to think about that schoolyard as that intervention that can lift up whatever climate, social, cultural health outcome is needed to address the needs that exist there. Um, when it comes to inspiring, it's really important to both feed the grassroots and the grass tops um, to demand community schoolyard interventions. Um, and this can be um, held in many different ways. Um, you know, for the Trust for Public Land, that, that kind of dual approach to advocacy and outreach and inspiring is super important to getting policy moved, um, but also really cultivating um, a, a completely um, robust um, set of partners. We're really excited to be working with the National Parent Teacher Association, National Education Association, School Board Association to um, recognize that the school facilities need to be improved for our students and, and you know, collaborate on advocacy opportunities. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics are a really um, important uh, partner in, in thinking about how health of students can be better, of health of children in particular can be better. And the World Resource Institute and Aspen Institute, um, we're working with them to help position um, schools as a climate-based intervention. So again, it's, it's thinking about this model as a tactic that can be scaled up. Um, because we face some significant challenges, but these are um, really um, tactical interventions that make a big difference. In the United States, um, this is quite specific to our country. There are many buckets of funding available to support community schoolyards. Um, the ESSER funds, um, which were over $190 billion, um, are in the hands of school districts. Many have been allocated, but not all. We're seeing many school districts um, earmark funds for schoolyards. Um, the state and local recovery fund, over $350 billion available. Schools and parks are both eligible. So we're seeing an uptick in improving community facilities because of these funds, which were allocated to help address some of the um, challenges of COVID. And, and we're seeing many other opportunities out there. The Parks Job and Equity Act is in response to um, a lot of, uh, you know, many other things and there's a hundred million dollars there. So there's, um, there are resources if you look for them and if you've been advocating for community schoolyards, you probably have already cultivated the folks who would help you to secure these funds for your schoolyards. And if not, um, the Trust for Public Land is, is happy to support these efforts. You know, for us, this is the time of, for the Green Schoolyard Movement. And we are, um, you know, we're on standby to support your efforts certainly in the United States, but I am so inspired to see um, folks coming in from the international community because no matter where, as Gail said, no matter where you are, um, community schoolyards can make a huge difference. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. This is, the, 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 this is really great. I think that we're gonna skip the question now and we're, we, we'll go uh, at the end the questions. But it was amazing how Daniel was talking about the equity, a hundred million Americans. Imagine this, one out of every three people that live in the US, the, in the cities, the wealthiest country in the world, and one out of three do not have a part within walking distance. This is unacceptable. And this is the same way in many countries all over the world. We need to have a part within walking distance now, in the next five years. There is absolutely no excuse. And if we don't have a part, we can have a school and turn into a magnificent school year. And even if we don't have a school, let's take a street and then let's do it. But this is, an, and some people say, oh, but the low income people. Well, those, that is where most of the people without school yards and without parks are. And low income people need even more because they, in the low income areas, people live in very small places. And when you live in a two or 300 square foot home, you don't live there, you sleep, you live outside. So low income areas, we need better sidewalks and better bikes and better parks, and better schools, and better schoolyards. So we need even more. And now all of this, I love public health because I think everything in cities is about health. And people love these schoolyards. They oh, how nice, how beautiful. But what is the benefit? It's, it's fun and games. Yeah, it's fun and games is very important. But in addition, it's good for physical and mental health. And we have Sadia Mokif, who's going to tell us about why do this? What is the impact? And immediately after Sadia finishes, we are going to open it up to questions, to comments. And then when she finishes, we'll have the chat open for everybody to. Uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, Mary Alice, um, 
or Daniel might put some websites where you can go and link into information at TPL. Thanks a lot, Sadia. We are eager to hear your comments on health and schoolyards. Great, Gail, thank you so much for um, inviting us. This is such a wonderful um, experience. And, and of course, Mary Alice and Danielle, I could listen to all day. Um, incredible work going on across the country. Um, so I will be um, speaking a little bit about the benefits of schoolyards. Um, and the, con the, the conversation around common sense came up a little bit earlier. Um, and I think it's one that is obviously very critical uh, as we move forward. So in cities, whether it's in the US or globally, we are facing some seriously complex challenges, right? So in the US, about 80%, more than 80% of people live in urban areas, and then globally, it's more than half. Um, and rapid urbanization has hastened the environmental degra degradation that we experience um, as uh, residents of these cities. In addition, um, the, the rapid urbanization has also sort of created these lifestyles that are far more sedentary than um, we had experienced before, especially with the reliance on cars, motorcycles, and mopeds. And so that really puts us at a higher risk for a number of issues, um, including obesity, as well as non-communicable um, chronic diseases. So for children specifically, experts recommend it's about 60 minutes of physical activity per day. Now, most children, at least in the US, um, spend far more time in front of a screen. Uh, uh, and, and as an adult with a, hopefully a, a youthful heart, um, I'm also very much guilty of that, right? Uh, but it's quite striking. Uh, Kaiser Family Foundation reported that somewhere around seven hours uh, was spent um, in front of a screen a day. That's incredible. That's over a hundred days of your sort of um, year years experience, right? Um, and that's a lot more time, that's a lot less time, excuse me, um, that's being spent outdoors, enjoying nature, enjoying parks, spending that time really being able to connect to the land. Um, we experience something and are continuing to experience something, uh, COVID-19, um, uh, in, in many, many places, um, and that has amplified, magnified all of that, right? Uh, both in terms of decreasing physical activity as well as increasing time in front of screens uh, in many places. Um, but in addition to that, you see this sort of uh, increase in stress, um, increase in stress that's um, kind of felt across the world. According to the World Health Organization, COVID-19 uh, COVID um, pandemic triggered about 25% increase in the prevalence of anxiety and depression worldwide. Um, this, of course, does not capture what you heard earlier from Danielle. It does not capture the, the climate stress that's uh, potentially being felt. It's not uh, capturing necessarily the stress of um, the, the infrastructure or jobs changing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, but we have an opportunity to change what this future holds, where you see images of people connected to screen and not each other, um, uh, stress, climate, to one that is far more hopeful and far more exciting. Um, and that's really where this Green Schoolyard um, initiative comes in as it fits with community health. So community health is this concept that really brings together people and it brings together place and it brings together um, all the different sectors, whether it's policy, whether it's uh, the researchers and evaluators, um, and to really think about how to optimize quality of life. And nature, access to nature is integral to that. Um, you're working culturally responsibly, working with communities as Mary Alice explained as well. Um, and that's, that's where we fit in, right? Where with green schoolyards, with parks, with um, the, the work that's being done to change the built environment that surrounds us, we're hopefully changing the default setting on our society. Um, and this is a pyramid, it's a framework for the way that public health intervenes. Um, it was articulated by Tom Frieden, former CDC director. And so we could do that kind of work in terms of public health at the very top, one-on-one -on -one counseling, hey, get more exercise. Or we could do what Gil did and make every single place much more walkable, much more bikeable, have places that people can spend time and leisure. 
And that's a proactive way to address um, the, the issues that we are facing rather than a reactive way to have the medical system respond to those health challenges. And so when we look at the health benefits, um, we're looking at sort of these categories, these broad-based categories, the physical, um, the well-being, sort of mental and social, and of course, the ramifications of the environmental. Um, physical uh, activity um, uh, increases, um, uh, as we see in, in a lot of the literature, a lot of the findings, um, when it comes to not just uh, green schoolyards, but parks in general, right? So parks, um, and uh, that's often combined. So CDC just recently published uh, a review review of all of that. So it's a review of all physical activity literature related to parks. And they found that physical activity increases when it's paired. Parks and people are paired together. So whether it's the program, whether it's activation or community engagement, um, it's really important to have those two things come together. Um, in 2015 studies, we also saw when um, children live closer to parks with programming, um, they saw uh, reduced uh, childhood uh, risk of obesity um, uh, in childhood. And so uh, that's that's inc incredibly important because of the ramifications, again, the long-term impacts that you see across the life course. Um, we see Im implications for stress levels. We see implications for attention restoration that um, Danielle um, spoke about um, in the classroom, very important, uh, very Teachers are very keen on, on components like that. And of course, pro-social behaviors. And then uh, the, the cooling effects. Um, we are a country that in every urban area, we see two realities, right? One that is thriving and one that is has the implications of climate um, injustice. And in order to address those, we really need to think in, intentionally about that infrastructure and that capacity um, that needs to be infused um, into quite literally the bricks, the ground, and, and the, 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 the infrastructure around us that will um, address some of these historical challenges that we experience around racism, around disinvestment, um, and around the, the structural um, uh, uh, sort of inequities uh, across the world, across the cities. Um, you heard a lot about absorbing stormwater as well from Mary Alice, um, but this image is one of the first this is one of the first places I saw when I was when I first joined the Trust for Public Land. Um, and I want you to think about this before the pandemic and what this feels like after the pandemic when children are outside, right? There are components of this that we need to think about, not just from sort of the logic, the, the, the um, expertise and the evidence, but what it means to have important aspect of quality of life to be able to enjoy the outdoors um, when, you're, when you're able to spend time together with friends uh, reading and learning. So now I'll get more, a little more, uh, a little less storytelling and a little more about the, the research. Um, so uh, Dr. Rainey, a researcher out of California, um, actually studied um, uh, green schoolyards. Uh, and in the study, uh, the team conducted a clinical trial. So they actually looked at sort of this uh, approach where they had a control group and they had a um, experimental group and they looked at information or sort of, um, uh, observations before and observations after, looking specifically at whether physical activity changes and whether social behavior changes among the children. And the children were in um, two schools in lower income settings, they're Title I schools. Um, and uh, uh, those the students were between the ages of, sort of first grade and fifth grade. And so they run this experimental design, right? Uh, Pre-greening, they look at the um, uh, what's going on. They use a very standardized uh, method, uh, uh, approach to observation called SoPlay. There are different um, aspects, there are different um, methods like so park as well. Um, and then there's so carp as well. Um, there's these like different methodologies to look at individuals and how they're using space um, in, in school settings or in parks in general in the outdoors. Um, and what they found um, was that uh, sedentary activity decreased by about 10%. Um, that's huge, right? Like that's exciting. But they also found that this, um, it was particularly important uh, when it comes, uh, when it came to in increasing vigorous activity among girls. Now girls in, in the literature, generally speaking, their um, physical activity le uh, levels tend to sort of decrease over time as they grow older um, as compared to boys, right? And so this is an important um, 
intervention to think about very intentionally when it comes to how we're looking at gender equity um, across our uh, youth um, in the country. Um, not only that, they also saw that student um, physical and verbal conflict rates decreased, and the time that students were spending alone also um, reduced. So before the intervention, um, students were spending much more time alone. And then after the intervention, the screening that happened, um, they found that uh, compared to the other the group, they that students were spending more time in these small groups and they were teachers observed that they were coming together and creating new games together. So while they weren't necessarily measuring the specific concept around um, creativity, but they did capture that, that important component. Um, interestingly, um, what they did, uh, especially importantly with the study, because we, we need to think about not just the before and after, but what happens four months from then? Right? What happens six months? What happens a year out? Um, and so uh, uh, the Rainey and, and uh, team um, are now looking, looked also at four months after the intervention and found that uh, those uh, vigorous activity levels actually did maintain when compared to pre-greening levels. That's fantastic. There are a lot of interventions that sort of um, have a novelty effect and then they dissipate over time. Um, so really, really important uh, when it comes to the implications we see. Now, this picture um, uh, is not from that schoolyard. This picture is from uh, one of our Philadelphia sites, I believe. Um, uh, so uh, I will correct that source on there. <laughs> All right. Um, so the second component that we're talking about, I'm gonna take a bit of another deep dive into another, another study. Um, this study is a qualitative study. Um, it's an ethnographer uh, approach, um, approach the, the time spent in nature, time spent outdoors, um, and did about 700 hours of observation in six different sites. And the sites really ranged, right? So you, there were um, sites in Maryland that had about um, 11, uh, uh, students, like very young, uh, young uh, age groups. Um, there were sort of a, a middle age group of like um, uh, sort of older elementary school students as well. Um, but then there were also teenagers and they were uh, engaged in activities, everything sort of from just sort of unstructured outdoor play uh, to outdoor learning as well as gardening, right? Um, so all of these kinds of the, the variation of spending time outdoors, but associated, of course, connected to that school um, uh, setting. And over the course of, um, uh, uh, this observations, the work that the, the um, researcher was doing, um, she was looking specifically at um, uh, stress and anxiety and resilience, right? And found that re the research, the, the body of evidence that was developed suggested that we consider that access to nature as a protective factor when it comes to resilience and as a potential intervention for stress reduction, stress management. Um, there is a lot of detail and a lot of rich evidence in the study. Um, and so I would encourage you all to, to read it. It's by um, uh, Chala, you'll see it um, uh, listed at the bottom there. Um, but one of these components, one of the, the stories that was elevated in this qualitative research really stood out to me. Um, and it was from a student, from a perspective, right? Stories tell, stories are so important in terms of understanding why, understanding how um, things are working, right? Like overall students were saying, you know, they felt more um, peaceful, more calm, more relaxed um, uh, in, in the, the spaces and time, right? That they were spending in the outdoors. Um, but this story was a child who went from a setting from an asphalt schoolyard to one that they had outdoor access. Um, and so the names have been changed, of course, but um, an eight-year-old, Elizabeth, uh, recalled that it felt like torture when she was in the sort of the asphalt um, setting because there, was, there was nothing to do. I just hung around with my friends. Her mother agreed. Mostly kids just stood around on the asphalt. When Elizabeth transferred to the school with the outdoor setting and um, uh, that had time and sort of uh, space built for that, and entered the woods on her first day, she exclaimed, how did this place get to be so amazing? Now, I don't know about you, but I want every child to be able to experience that, right? Like that should be the standard of care uh, when we think about a perspective of 
of, of public health or health care, we always think about what is the standard of care and green schoolyards should indeed be that standard of care. Um, so one of the things that I also wanted to point out that I found quite interesting in this um, study was that as the researcher um, was looking at these habitats, these environments, um, they found that um, in the building, so we're looking at like 700 hours of, uh, uh, you know, uh, observations here, but inside of the building, students engaged in sometimes arguments, there were kind of aggressive exchanges, etc. But in those 700 hours of observation, um, there was not a single incidence of such a behavior seen um, outdoors. Now imagine that, we're talking about really rich information, really rich evidence for pro-social behavior. Um, and this is not the only study that this uh, speaks towards that. So I would definitely encourage you um, to, to explore this literature um, and, and of course, um, a dig in deep as we connect um, our built environment, our schools and our health uh, together. And you have seen these before and after, so I'm gonna skip right over this one, but you can see that difference. Um, but in addition to the physical health, the well-being, um, both um, uh, individual uh, as well as the community well-being that is experienced, um, there, of course, the environmental implications, right? Um, heat is the leading cause of weather-related mortality in the US. One might think it's tornadoes, one might think it's hurricanes, they're sort of, uh, but there are really, really strong implications when it comes to heat. Um, and these green spaces can have uh, cooling effects um, and, and have been cited. There's a, quite the variation depending, of course, on the assets, uh, the trees uh, available in the green space, um, green spaces, but um, uh, six degrees is what we often cite uh, here. But it's getting attention. Like our cities are going to have to deal with this work of ensuring that we're cooling so that we're protecting our residents. Um, and one of the ways to think about that is through data, right? So we have a platform that uh, you may wanna explore called ParkServe, um, and it's a nationwide assessment uh, of cities and uh, provides a citywide um, heat island information and identifies specific priority zones. Um, in addition to that, there's also information on there about demographics, uh, income, age, population density, et cetera. Um, for those of you who are in uh, advocacy role or decision maker role or explore role, whatever it may be, um, great opportunity to explore what's happening locally. Um, and finally, we know that policy change matters, right? Like if we're going to talk about downstream health outcomes, we need to think about upstream policies. Um, and so we are partnering with uh, the organization um, called City Health, um, look specifically at uh, different policies for a variety of different issues, um, um, but we're partnering them specifically around green space to ensure that everyone lives within a 10 minute walk uh, of their home, that there's tree canopy goal uh, in there in the language, that there's investment um, strong investment language, and that there's a clear prioritization, a very specific prioritization around equity. Um, and would be happy to share additional information or drop a link in the chat for that. Um, and that's really trying to reach the 75 largest cities in the country. We'll be releasing those um, uh, medals um, in December 2020. So looking forward to sharing that uh, then as well. So in conclusion, um, promoting community schoolyards um, for health development, climate equity, um, it's for children and it's for the communities. So that instead of a future like this for our cities, um, we're looking uh, to sprint toward a future like this one. Um, so super excited to be here again. And thank you so much for having me. I wanna thank you. So, Sadia, Mary Allen, Daniel, you have been amazing. You have been inspiring. And I hope, I wish you all the very best. Let's hope that the gap, so that every child in the US and around the world have a, a, has a quality part within a short walk happens very, very, very soon. Thank you very much and all the best to everyone. Take care. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.